Uh, all right. Eye and ear. This is one of my favorite lectures. Behold such a sight. Angels sing in their design, eye and ear sublime. All right. So a lot of my history has focused on um, the Western Hemisphere, hasn't it? Uh, I've talked, obviously, about uh, some Europeans, a lot of Romans and, and Greeks. I've talked about uh, people from the Islamic world. Um, Asia is home to one of the most ancient of, of cultures on earth. And the level of understanding that was achieved in the Indus Valley uh, what was staggering for its time, far beyond uh, understanding uh, anywhere else in the world. And that understanding radiated out of uh, the Indus Valley um, and became the bedrock uh, for, for uh, Eastern understanding uh, of the body. This guy was a, a, a big part of that tradition, uh, certainly not the beginning of it, the, the uh, the origins of uh, sort of advanced culture in uh, the Indus Valley was 10,000 years ago, right? That's a long time ago, folks. Wasn't anything happening in Europe back then. Uh, but this gentleman was not that far back. This was about 3,000 years ago. Um, his name was Shashruta. And uh, he was a um, surgeon and uh, a, a yogi uh, and an advocate of Ayurvedic uh, practice, Ayurvedic thought, which was the school of thought related to medicine and health and nutrition and, and care of the body uh, in the, in the, as part of, of yoga. Uh, what yoga, in a, in, a, in a more broad sense of the term than most people are, are commonly a, a, understand it. Um, not just like doing poses, but yoga meaning union of uh, the mind and the body. So this dude uh, did a lot of things, a lot of things. He was actually the first person to uh, isolate and refine sugar. Uh, that's, a, that's a sort of interesting tidbit that uh, as a carbohydrate chemist I'll throw out there for you. But um, one of the many things he did that, that gets him on the slide here today is that he had a text uh, in which he described um, almost a hundred different ocular diseases and conditions almost 3,000 years ago. That's incredible. Um, yeah, so amongst these, uh, there were, what does it say, 51 of uh, these different uh, ocular disorders. He had... Uh, concrete, objective surgical techniques to deal with. He developed surgical tools uh, for the, these different ocular uh, disorders. He is described as having been the first cataract surgeon. Uh, this guy was removing cataracts almost 3,000 years ago. It makes me want to cry. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. It's pretty remarkable uh, for the early stage in history. <laughs> and, then, and then I jumped to John Freak. <laughs> I, I, I just, uh, I like the guy's wig. Um, so <laughs> this, this is our response to the, the Western response, uh, not necessarily mine, um, to Shushruta. Uh, this was the modern age of ophthalmology. And, and really, it, it wasn't until uh, this guy that um, the... European culture was able to, to catch up, to begin to catch up to this, this level of erudition. Um, yeah, he uh, established modern ophthalmology uh, here at Morsefield in, in London. Has anybody visited London before? Well, if you do and you're interested in the eyes, you could go there. It's a historical uh, site of, of this gentleman's work. That's all. I'm not going to do a lot of history today. So, showed you this picture in lab today, and I kind of, uh, uh, you know, touched on some of these uh, functions. 
uh, but I'll go through them a little bit. Um, the sclera, as part of the fibrous layer, uh, the job of the sclera is uh, to um, support the eye, protect the eye. Uh, so the eye is a, is a pretty delicate organ, right? And uh, we don't want uh, the, the eye punctured in any way. Um, and so the sclera helps protect it. It does more than that, though. The sclera and the cornea together add to the focusing power of the eye. They both have a role in how the eye uh, comes to focus. I didn't write that down uh, on the slide, but it, maybe it's on a future slide. I'm not sure, but it is a, an important point. Uh, so the cornea itself, has anybody had um, LASIK or RK, radiokeratotomy, any of that stuff? You know what I'm talking about? Do they still do that? They must. Uh, it's the like etching that they do on the on the cornea so that you don't need to wear cataracts or uh, contacts. Pardon me. Definitely don't wear cataracts. <laughs> um, so the sclera, uh, on the other hand, doesn't actually do any direct focusing, but because of the tensile strength that it gives to the eye. It uh, is going to it's going to be involved in providing force against which uh, these ciliary muscles over here and here work uh, in terms of focusing the uh, lens, changing the shape of the lens, and it may not work the way you suspect it works. So keep an open mind. We'll talk about that when we get there. Um, next uh, is the uvea. The next layer in is the uvea. And so this is the vascular layer, as I said in lab, uh, composed of the iris, the ciliary body, and the choroid. Um, and it holds, of course, the blood vessels, uh, also importantly, the lymphatic vessels of the eye. Uh, this is responsible for bringing the nutrients and oxygen into the eye, taking the waste away. Um, but it's also um, responsible for m regulating the amount of light that gets in vis-a-vis uh, -vis through the dilation or contraction or constriction of the uh, iris. Um, and then uh, it's going to secrete the fluid components of the vitreous humor in the posterior cavity and the aqueous humor in the anterior cavity. And lastly, it, the ciliary body is going to be responsible for uh, controlling the shape of the lens. All right, And, and because of that, the uh, iris, which is responsive to uh, light um, conditions, and the ciliary body, uh, which is going to be responsive to uh, the needs of accommodation, that is the focusing on near and far objects and, and changing uh, the shape of the lens. Both of those structures are going to be uh, invested with uh, autonomic, a lot of autonomic uh, innervation. So there's a lot of uh, autonomics both parasympathetic and sympathetic nerves that will terminate in those structures in the eye. Okay, so I, I'm not going to, I have this in here so that I can review, review the anatomy a little bit. And I don't need to review the anatomy so much because we just did it. But uh, I, I also show here the point of this slide is that light comes in, passes through the pupil, uh, is focused by the lens, and the center of your field of view falls uh, on the, the fovea, like, I don't know, someone in lab said today. I don't remember who that was. Yeah. Um, is there any other point that I was going to make here? I don't think so. Oh, you know, I, I guess I must have cut out the external eye muscles out of lab. That's okay. You don't need them. Um, so I've used this word a couple times. Accommodation. Um, the accommodation is the process where the eye changes the shape of the lens to uh, be able to focus an image on the back wall of the retina. So um, if you see here, the lens is rounded, ciliary muscles are contracted, the, mu the lens is rounded, and uh, this helps us uh, focus 
on things that are close. All right, when the lens is rounder, uh, you focus on things that are close. So, for example, um, I have a hand lens in my pocket. Useful thing to carry, actually. And if you look at this, uh, this is a. If you were to look at this, uh, there, the lens on it is is really rounded, much more round than uh, a magnifying glass that you might use to look at something further away. But to get that thing to, to work, you have to like stick it right on your eye and stick your face right up to the thing, all right? So it's, it's really for uh, looking at things up close. Whereas uh, when the ciliary muscles relax, this, uh, this lens gets flattened and uh, helps them focus on things that are further away. Does this make sense to everybody? It does. Nobody's a little bit confused by this at all? There is something strange about this, though. Why, when this contracts, does that make this round? It's not pressing on it, is it? It's not, because it's being suspended by these ligaments. These ligaments are under tension. How, when these muscles contract, is this rounded? Why, when it is relaxed, this thing gets flattened? Does that not seem a little bit strange? What's actually the dynamic here? Does anyone want to speculate? I'll give you a hint. James is smiling, maybe. I'll give you a, a hint. I'll give you a hint. Um, it's related to what I was saying about the sclera. It was related to what I was saying about the sclera a couple slides ago and how the sclera is involved in uh, helping to change the shape of the lens. Okay, so <clears throat> the sclera is this, is this stiff, fibrous structure, all right? And there is a ring of muscle around the margin of the sclera called the ciliary muscle, right? So you notice that the sclera sort of ends right here right at the same place that we have the ciliary muscle. And that ciliary muscle, remember, is a band that goes all the way around that. So when that muscle contracts, it's going to pull the opening of the sclera together, all right, actually changing the shape of the eye slightly, and thus releasing tension on the lens, allowing the lens to relax to its more rounded resting shape. When those muscles relax, that the, the stiffness of the sclera is going to bow back out and tug on these uh, tug on these ligaments and then flatten the uh, flatten the lens. Okay? So what's flattening the lens here is the pressure of the sclera. What is rounding the lens is just releasing that pressure. It's not actually squeezing on the lens. Does that make some sense now? Okay. Is there anyone astigmatic in the room? You don't have to tell me if you don't want. Uh, astigmatism is the uh, property of the shape of the eye in general, just particularly the lens, but the shape of the eye not being radially uniform, okay? It's not, it's not uniform uh, around the entire 360. Um, and so, uh, for example, uh, that's either the, it can be the lens, it can be the cornea, et cetera. Uh, so this would be the shape of a normal cornea, and this would be a cornea with astigmatism. Uh, this, these are some examples of the way something might look to a person through an ast who has astigmatism. Maybe they're going to get some kind of like double vision, right? Or like blurred vision where part of the image is being put in one part of the retina and another part of it is, is repeated in some other part of the retina, slightly uh, shifted. So uh, you can test if you have astigmatism by looking at this chart and with one eye, uh, if you don't have lenses, taking your lenses off. Uh, you know, if you have lenses, take the lens off. Uh, focus your one eye at the center of that, and each of the bars 
if you do not have astigmatism, should look equally spaced. However, if it, it doesn't look completely equally spaced around that, uh, around that dial, then uh, that's an indication that there may be some astigmatic uh, shape to the uh, eye. So <clears throat> that's astigmatism. Emetropia is, is simply like good vision, sweet vision, no problem, no deformation. Emetropic, a person who's emetropic, you don't hear that word a lot, but it just is a person who does not have vision problems. Um, okay. Any, any questions about astigmatism? Nope. Visual acuity. I'm just going through some basic ocular definitions here for you. Uh, your visual acuity is the clarity of vision that you have. And uh, like I said, an emetropic is a person who has normal vision, or what we call 20-20. 20-20 vision means uh, it's, it's a relative definition. So it means if you are 20-20, you can see at 20 yards a certain standard of resolution, which we define as being what you should with ideal human vision be able to see at, at, at oh, it's not yards, it's feet, sorry, at 20 feet. Uh, you should be able to see what they define as what you should be able to see at 20 feet. So it's kind of a relative definition. Um, not everybody sees 2020. Some people never see 2020. Some people actually can see a little better than 2020. There are some people out there that have a little bit better than 2020. Um, and your visual acuity can be uh, impaired in one of, of two different ways. Uh, you may have a problem uh, accommodating on something that is far or something that is near. Right. So if you have uh, if you have the ability to focus on uh, things that are near, but uh, not things that are far, you're you're called uh, myopic or nearsighted. Um, and what happens here is that uh, the shape of the eyeball is such that uh, the focus uh, is, is in front of, is in front of uh, the back wall of the retina. So to fix this, you get a, what's called a diverging lens, a diverging lens. Uh, and that will throw the image back on, onto the right place on the eye. Uh, on the other hand, hyperopia, farsightedness, uh, this is where the image gets put on uh, further behind the uh, eye of the retina. This is where the focal point is. It doesn't ever make it. It only gets as far as that, of course, uh, but this is where it should be. So we get a converging lens with hyperopia, and uh, we're back on the right the right spot. Um, okay, so uh, elderly people uh, naturally become hyperopic uh, because not because of uh, the shape of the lens as or the shape of the, the eye as much as the lens is no longer elastic uh, any longer. It's no longer elastic, and because of that. Um, they need corrective lenses. Most people become pres. Yeah, sir. Yeah, the muscles can get weak, or also what happens is they have reduced uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic tone uh, with time, particularly parasympathetic tone. Par parasympathetic tone tends to go down in, in people with age, particularly because most people are so what are, what's called sympathetically trained. Um, most of our a lot of people spend like a large portion of their time like on go, go, go or whatever, you know, or maybe at like higher levels of stress and don't uh, like encourage, you know, a balanced parasympathetic tonus. Uh, and so with time, your parasympathetic capacity goes down and then that's going to reduce your ability to, I don't know. Anyways, we call it presbyopia, and the way you can remember that is, uh, is it Anglican? 
church where they have presbytery. Well, it would be a Presbyterian church, I guess. I don't know if there are any Presbyterians in the house. But uh, a presbyter is, and a Presbyterian church is an elder. It's a church elder. Uh, so presbyter just means elder. And presbyopia, it just means elderly uh, vision. So. Okay. So uh, now is the retina. And uh, the retina, if we look at the retina, you can see, let me say this. The retina and the optic nerve in particular are unique. It's a unique structure in the body because it is the only nerve in the body that can be visualized, that you can actually look at from outside of the body without having to like be invasive. You can look at the optic nerve, and that is extremely powerful. Uh, the optic nerve and uh, this disc that uh, is where the optic nerve enters reports on a stunning array of different conditions. All right, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, off center from that is the fovea. Uh, and the fovea is that little dimple I talked about, which is in this region called the macula. And you can see that the, the retinal arteries kind of converge around the macula, but, but, uh, but uh, we don't have large branches passing right through it because um, it is the place of the highest density of photoreceptors. Um, so you may wonder why I have this, like, necktie guy with a little red pin in his lapel there. Um, I don't know how often it's, you see it anymore, but this is definitely like an old school neuro-ophthalmologist. So an ophthalmologist is an eye doctor. A neuro-ophthalmologist is an eye doctor whose, whose focus is on the, the optic nerve and the, and the like neural part of the eye. Uh, you would have... Uh, Neuro-ophthalmologists would walk into the room, and they, they'd often have this little red pin in their lapel like that. Uh, and the reason that would be is because you, with that red, like, quilting pen, you can very quickly and surprisingly accurately get a sense of uh, the visual field that a person may have, and whether they have what are called scotomas. Um, I don't know, do I have that word written down somewhere? I don't. Uh, well, I'll write the word. Uh, scotoma. Uh, a blind spot is, they call it a scotoma. So, <clears throat> um, there are no photoreceptors on... There are no photoreceptors on the optic disc. It's a blind spot. All of us have a blind spot. You're like, I don't have a blind spot. I can, I can see everything, right? You have a blind spot. And you can prove that you have a blind spot. Uh, you can do it with, it's best done with one of these needles where you close one of your eyes and you take uh, the needle, the, uh, the pin of the needle, and you hold it out 23 degrees lateral from the center of your field of view and that red top of the needle will disappear it'll disappear so this uh it'll probably work best for the people in the center of the room here maybe the people on the sides it won't work as well for it, but maybe uh so what you're trying to do here is you're going to close one eye and if you're looking if you're using your right eye you're going to look at the left cross and you're going to kind of move it around maybe look around the right, left cross i had to look to the to the left of the left cross and now the the little dot disappeared you can find your blind spot did you see that how that happened that who worked who did that work for yeah if you mess with it you can find your blind spot and that's because the light from that spot, and you can do it on the other side too, but you just have to look in the other direction. Uh, the light from that spot 
is falling right on the optic disc. And there's no photoreceptors there. There's no photoreceptors there at all. And you're, but like, whoa, how come there's not like a black spot there when I'm looking at stuff? Well, it's your brain, you're never paying attention to 23 degrees off center, right? And your brain just sort of takes the things that are around there and smudges them together in your field of view and kind of approximates it and sort of just, you know, whatever. It's just a little spot. But uh, these neuro, oops, these, uh, a good neuro ophthalmologist can actually quickly map out that because sometimes that blind spot can get kind of big in some people. It can get kind of big in some people because... Maybe there's high pressure in the back of the eye. Uh, that, or in, maybe there's high intracranial pressure. Maybe the person had uh, some closed head injury. There's swelling in the brain, and it's pushing on the back of the eye, and it's, it's cutting off blood supply, or something's going on there. Maybe there's a tumor in the brain. Maybe the person has MS. Maybe that, like, on and on and on. There's all these different reasons. Uh, so... Here are some different types of pathology. I said that you can learn an enormous amount from the back of the eye. Um, so here's the, here's the optic nerve in a person with glaucoma. Glaucoma means elevated uh, pressure inside the eye. Too much uh, uh, aqueous humor in the eye, in the vitreous. is like pressing on it, and it's occluding the blood, and it's basically starving the retina, and this blind spot is getting bigger. Um, here's a, this is what a healthy one looks like. Uh, this one here has got multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is some kind of inflammatory disorder. Uh, this is some kind of infection, uh, arteritis. Um, it can report on other things like, is the person taking drugs? Do they have a tumor? Were they going through radiation therapy? All of this stuff and more can be... Uh, divined by a, a good, uh, a person with a good ophthalmic scope and who knows what they're looking at. Sadly, not a lot of doctors actually do know what the hell they're looking at when they look in your eye. Um, and one of the first ways you can know whether the doctor who is looking in your eye knows what the hell they're doing or not is how they're going about it. Um, a lot of, so this is a pretty common first year, uh, you know, medical rotation uh, mistake right here. They're, they're trying to respect, like, rightfully so, trying to respect a person's personal space, and they're, like, getting back here to look in somebody's eye. That's not how it works, folks. I, I just showed you that lens, wherever my hand lens went. You have to get right on top of something for the ophthalmoscope to work. You have to get right up next to that person. So if you're looking in the right eye, you use your right eye to look in theirs because that way you're not kissing them or something. Um, but you get right up on there and you're going to, the person moves all around like this so you can see the whole uh, inside of the retina. That's how it's done properly, how it's done properly. Um, truthfully, nowadays, we're, we live in such a high-tech world that um, uh, we live in such a high-tech world that uh, there is there's, there's quite a bit of gadgetry that does a lot of this stuff uh, for you. So here is um, one example, uh, high-definition optical uh, coherence tomography. You basically chill out in a chair and they uh, stick this little camera up next to your eye and it, it does all of this for you. So for example, uh, this is uh, my right and left fovea in, in my eye. This is one for my eye. Uh, and you can get like a three-dimensional structure of it and you can look at uh, retinal rim thickness and do all these statistics or whatever that are far beyond um, anything that uh, was available even 15 years ago. Um, all right. So one of the uh, things that is interesting about this kind of technique is they can... Um, has anybody ever had floaters in their eye? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So uh, floaters, for those who haven't experienced them, are these uh, little 
that they just look, it's like you think you've got some kind of lint on your eye that kind of moves around when you try to look at it or whatever. But it's actually the vitreous has uh, partially detached from the back wall of the retina. And uh, there can be little bits of protein in there that can uh, float across your field of view. Uh, it, it, can, it ranges from entirely harmless and something that happens to most people at some point in their eye, particularly if you uh, do a lot of diving or that's what happened to me while I was in here. Um, I had, had gone uh, deep water diving and, and like I'm suddenly seeing all this weird stuff. Uh, it resolved, uh, but it's, it's fine now. Two, it can be pathologic where it can actually uh, lead to retinal detachment with time where the retina will actually peel away from uh, the, uh, the underlying choroid. That's not, that's not cool. But this, uh, this technique here gives you a really excellent way of visualizing uh, in, in high definition uh, the relationship between the vitreous and uh, and the retina in the back of the eye. Okay, so on to photoreception. All right, so that I've I've talked about all the sort of fun stuff, uh, and now we get now we get into the, like the miraculous. Um, there are two categories of photoreceptors: rods and cones. Most people know that uh, rods are uh, they're they're quite different from one another. Uh, rods are for what is called scotopic vision. Scotopic vision, this is dark vision. This allows you to see um, in the dark, you know, the, as much as you can see in the dark. Very low light conditions is what I mean. Uh, and it's black and white vision. This gives you uh, just the sense of shadows and, uh, and contrast. It's very sensitive. It, so these uh, types of photoreceptors don't need much light to be tripped off. Right? Just a few photons, just a single photon will, will get these things going. Uh, on the other hand, there are cones. And uh, cones have, the way cones work, they're highly resolved. Right? So there's a high density of them. It's again like this uh, receptive field thing that we were talking about uh, the other day. Maybe it was that yesterday. Uh, the receptive field thing. Uh, these cones are, give you a high resolution. It's like touch in your lips or in your fingers. All right. Uh, high resolution, uh, and they're most concentrated in the fovea, and uh, they are not as highly sensitive as as uh, a rod is, however. They give rise to what we consider to be color vision. And it's considered to be color vision because these cones, there are three types of them uh, and, and in humans, and the, uh, they, are, they have color maxima at red, uh, green, and, and blue, essentially. Uh, and you, they have like a profile of different colors that will light them up. I'll, I think I have a slide that I'll show of that in a bit. And the brain interprets uh, the, the signals from those three different types of cones as different shades and then integrates them and gives us the color that we see. Let's, let's see a little bit more about how this actually works. So... <clears throat> um, the basic structure is, is a little bit different in one versus the other. In the rods, we have these discs, these membrane, these stacks of membrane discs. Uh, and whereas in the cones, this membrane just has a single fold that sort of uh, stacks up uh, on itself. Uh, it's, it's, they're both labeled discs in that diagram, but this, the structure is a little bit different. Uh, between one and the other. What is the same is that they are the stacks of membranes, and in the membrane is embedded uh, this protein, all right? And the protein uh, has, um, the protein is called opsin, and 
when that opsin protein, that's this whole transmembrane protein, so we have these like hydrophobic alpha helices that are going through the, the membrane, and then we have the, uh, the like more hydrophilic or whatever globular parts that are outside, extra membranous parts. Uh, when the opsin protein is, has this little guy here bound to it, which is called retinal, we get this from vitamin A, I'll show you a picture of that in a bit, but when this molecule retinal is bound to opsin, the complex of it is called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin. Um, and they call it rhodopsin because it's a chromophore that is in the same color region as rhodamine. Um, that's by and by. I probably won't help anyone remember it. But uh, yeah, this is called rhodopsin. And um, this is the protein. And in fact, specifically, this is the, the molecule that's going to absorb the light. It's going to absorb the photon. And it's going to be the trigger that's going to cause a sequence of molecular events that's going to lead to uh, photoreception and our, and our sensation of, of sight. So uh, let's look at this a little bit. Or let's go through each of the parts. We have the pigmented epithelium that these are embedded into. There's this outer segment that has the discs where the rhodopsin is embedded. There's an inner segment that has all the other stuff the cell needs, like the mitochondria and the nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's the synapse with the bipolar cells uh, downstream. OK. Let's look at how this works. It works differently than you might have guessed. It works differently than I would have guessed when I first learned about it. At least I know that. Uh, because what we've learned so far about the way neurons work is that the resting state of the neuron, it's just like, it's quiet. It's just sitting there. And then it's at minus 70 tra transmembrane potential millivolts, right? And something happens, some stimulus comes in, trips it, and there's an action potential, and it starts, uh, it starts going out. Well, the thing is, this actually works the exact opposite to that. It works the exact opposite to that. When we're sitting there in the dark, this cell is spontaneously depolarizing all the time all the time, is spontaneously depolarizing. And we call this the dark current. So the sodium channels that are in the extracellular uh, membrane, right, uh, that would be, uh, you know, if you were, if you had a, some, some kind of a synapse, if you had some kind of a synapse, uh, there would be a chemical that would come and open up the gate and sodium would come in or whatever, right, at a synapse. Uh, it it's, doesn't work like that. This gate is just constitutively open. It just means like normally open. Uh, this is uh, coupled to cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP. Has anyone heard of cyclic GMP before? Maybe I, hear, I see a nod. Not too many. Most people have it. So uh, there are the nucleotides, right? There's the nucleotides are A, T, G, and C, right? The four things that, are, that DNA are made out of. And the A, uh, adenine, uh, is what we uh, use when it's triphosphorylated to make ATP, right? You can take AMP, the monophosphorylated one, you can cyclize it and have cyclic AMP, and that has its own biology. Well, the G, the guanosine, uh, you can cyclize the monophosphorylated version of that, uh, and it acts as a, a, messenger, a messenger molecule in the cell, okay? Um, so we call this a, a G protein, uh, a G coupled uh, 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 channel right here. It's coupled to cyclic GMP. Uh, and when cyclic GMP is attached, the door is open, sodium is blowing in the cell, but then there's this current of sodium that's coming down and getting pumped back out 
because clearly there's some kind of ATP driven sodium pump down here that's just throwing it back out of the cell. So we're burning ATP here and we're just letting it come back in uh, upstairs. I didn't start the fire. I just, okay. Um, here's step one. Let there be light. Photon comes down and hits this molecule of retinal that's embedded in the rhodopsin. All right? And let's look at retinal a little bit closer. All right? I'm not going to have you draw this on the final or anything, but I have to put some chemical structures up so I can talk about it a little bit. Don't get too scared. Uh, here it is. There's this little tail, and then it's what's called a conjugated double bond system. Who's taking organic chemistry? Okay, most of you. Good. About half of you. Um, a conjugated double bond system is one in which you have a single bond alternating with a double bond. All right? And uh, because of that, to, to have a double bond, you use what are called pi electrons. They're p orbitals that, oh, I know I'm talking about p orbitals in anatomy class. Uh, they're they're uh, p orbitals that enable that double bond to exist. But because of the structure of those p orbitals, that bond, it prevents that bond, that double bond, from rotating. A single bond can rotate freely, all right? Double bonds cannot. And if we look at this, uh, across any double bond, there are, there are four different places, right? This double bond here has the big chunk on the opposite side of this double bond from this other big chunk. So this is trans. This double bond is trans. This big chunk and this little hydrogen are on the same side, and this little methyl group and this big chunk are on the same side. The two big chunks are trans, meaning on opposite sides of this double bond. Whereas this double bond is the only one in this conjugated system where the big chunks are on the same side. They're both they're both on this side of this double bond and not on this side. That's a, it's actually a high energy position. It's a high energy position. It doesn't give a lot of, lot of leg room here. This methyl group is bumping into this chunk over here, right? Everybody's, everybody's knocking into each other. Um, and it would like to not be in this position, all right? The thing about pi orbitals, pi, like conjugated systems, is that uh, because of the electronic structure, which we're obviously not going through at all, but because of that electronic structure, it's able to absorb photons. Uh, it's able to absorb energy and step up to a different, uh, to a different energy level, rearrange itself, so we get an isomerization and when this 11 cis retinal absorbs a photon, it's able to shift from the cis configuration to the trans. That's the trigger. That's the spring. All right. The exact frequency of light that this that this uh, chain of pi electrons will absorb is modulated, is changed slightly by the context imposed by the rhodopsin. So the different colors of, of uh, cones that you guys see, that you have, is because each of those cones has slightly different opsin molecules. It's the opsin itself that's changing the way, uh, the exact frequency of light that the cis retinal is going to absorb. All right. So it, light comes in, changes this, sets off the trigger, and then now it's just all dominoes. We're just going to play, we're just going to play dominoes for a little bit. Well, rhodopsin, this, this happens, the tri so 11 cis goes to 11 trans right now, activates transducin, which activates uh, this protein called phosphodiesterase, PDE. Do I, should I write that down for you, phosphodiesterase? It 
And phosphodiesterase cleaves the phosphodiester bond. It's gonna, well, let's get to that step here. Oh, it is, it does say phosphodiesterase on the slide. Uh, it cleaves, it cleaves uh, the phosphodiester bond in C uh, GMP and just makes regular GMP out of it. GMP cannot bind to this door. So the door just swings shut and sodium is not able to just rush into the cell any longer. So that takes us from minus 40 up to minus 70. All right? And what happens here is when it's at minus 40, this is actually released. It's ca it causes the cell to release neurotransmitter here. But this neurotransmitter is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's put in the brakes on this bipolar cell. It's, this is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's putting the brakes on that bipolar cell. When we close the door and turn this cell off, right, because right now it's going. we got the dark current. It's releasing neurotransmitter. You should think that, what would that be doing? But this is inhibitory. It's preventing the bipolar cell from going. So that, that's probably a GABAergic synapse, right? I talked about GABA uh, yesterday as being an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Well, in fact, that's, that is what it is. These are, these are GABAergic receptors. This right here is a diagram of a typical synapse. No, you're not going to have to memorize any of that. It's like super complicated. I'd, I'd struggle to walk you through everything there. Um, but what the point of me putting it up there is to say that the synapse from the, from, the, uh, from the neuroreceptor, the photoreceptor, to the bipolar cell, it's being, uh, it's, it's being modulated by horizontal cells. Remember I told you that? And it's also being modulated by on-center and off-center bipolar cells. So there are like four, five, six, seven different neurons interact, all interacting at the same junction in one of these synapses. Super complicated, very complicated, uh, very sophisticated, maybe one of the most sophisticated synapses in the body. All right. Um, so it absorbed a photon. Now what? Well, uh, as soon as that happens, uh, the 11 trans retinal does not want, it doesn't stick to opsin very well. In fact, it pops right off. Uh, there's some enzyme here that's job, it, whose job it is to recycle 11 cis retinal. It uses, it burns some ATP to catalyze that transition. Because remember, 11 cis is actually a high energy thing. It's like a spring, spring loaded. It doesn't want to be like that. Uh, and then as soon as 11 cis retinal exists, it's happy to get back on the opsin molecule and regenerate uh, rhodopsin. So this process right here is called bleaching. Um, bleaching. You're bleaching the, uh, the photo bleaching, the retinal off of uh, the rhodopsin and, and uh, just... Uh, leaving retinal and opsin behind. So, for example, this is why uh, when you look at a really bright light, I guess uh, I'll say this, why not? Uh, like you guys are out here like enjoying the lecture talking to me, and I'm, I'm enjoying the lecture, you know, I talk it, uh, I'm, I'm doing my thing, but I'm like constantly being blinded by that projector. It's always like this like super bright light right there, and I try to not look at it because if I do look at it, I'm like suddenly blind for a second because it like it photo bleaches me, right? Who's looked at a really bright light for a little bit too long and then you look away and you still see it, right? You still see it. That's the photo bleaching where you have photo bleached all of the uh, opsin, uh, all the rhodopsin in that part of the eye, right?
yeah, Lindsay, I, I can't I can't really look at you too much because every time I look at you, I'm like, oop, there it goes. Uh, okay. Dark vision, scotopic vision. So that's uh, night vision. There are people who have uh, night blindness, and this is uh, primarily due to a, a vitamin A deficiency. Okay, so here is transretinal, and we call it transretinal because it, the al, the chemical nomenclature here, maybe you'll remember from your organic chemistry, the al. Uh, means that this is an aldehyde, this C double bond, oh, that's an aldehyde group. Um, but transretinal comes from transretinol. It's just an oxidized version of transretinol where the alcohol group gets turned into an aldehyde group. There's some other rearranging that goes on, of course, but uh, that, that's basically it. Um, where do we get retinol or vitamin A? Well, a good source of it is beta carotene. We just, all we have to do is take beta carotene and oxidate, oxidatively hydrolyze it, uh, like add some water across that, and we're gonna get two molecules of retinol for every one molecule of beta carotene. Beta carotene is thankfully a delicious uh, component of carrots, of course, and all kinds of other vegetables. Beta carotene is found all over the place uh, in the in the vegetable kingdom. Um, it this so when you look at this, uh, obviously vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin, isn't it? I mean, if you look here, it's embedded. Maybe here, I suppose it, it's embedded in the transmembrane or hydrophobic portion of opsin. Um, and uh, this is why they add vitamin A to milk because milk has a high fat content and it's easy it's an easy way to deliver vitamin A to the system so that, that's they put vitamin A along with vitamin D which is a different story okay uh, the dual vision system Okay, so we have the scotopic system, which is low light, high sensitivity. So only a little bit of light uh, makes it so that, um, that you see something. And then there's the photopic system, high resolution, sharp detail, uh, but not as, not as sensitive. Um, and... The scotopic vision is uh, produced by the rods, so the periphery of your retina is, is highly enriched in rods, whereas uh, the photopic system is cones, and that tends to be centered on the, on the fovea, right? Uh, this is where we have the highest density of, of, um, of those. There are other differences, though. So one of the things you'll notice here is that uh, in rods, there's this high degree of convergence, right? So one ganglion cell is monitoring uh, this large number of rods, whereas a single ganglion cell is pretty much tied to a single uh, cone. So there's not as much convergence. That means, uh, so here with rods, if a photon hits any of these rods anywhere within this single square millimeter of retina, it's all going to go through the same doorway out. This is like the large receptive field that we had on our back, right? Where I can't really tell the difference between a photon that hits here and a photon that hits here. Low spatial resolution but high sensitivity to uh, a photon coming in. And it's the opposite here. The photon at this spot is, gives me a, a totally different sensation than a photon at this spot. But 
you know, I have in low light, I have a very low chance of actually picking something up there. So they're lower in sensitivity. They also are, are structurally different. These uh, ganglion cells are called uh, M or Magno. Uh, they just look different because they're like they have a ton of uh, more cells coming into them. And these are parvo. Parvo just means small. P cells, parvo, and M cells, Magno. So yeah, functionally they have uh, these different these different roles. So uh, these M cells give us the general shape of an object, particularly in low light, uh, help us to know when something's moving, um, gives us shadows and dim light, whereas uh, the parvo uh, are going to give us like high detail, fine detail, like edges, uh, color, of course. All right. So there is... Uh, I'm going to continue going through retinal information processing a little bit because I find it interesting. Uh, here are just some statistics about retinal convergence. Uh, one, there are 130 million photoreceptors, but there's only 1 million ganglion cells in the eye. That's a significant amount of convergence there. It's two orders of magnitude, um, over two orders of magnitude. And uh, so that's one type of convergence. There's some sort of integration that's happening there. Uh, but there's horizontal integration as well, uh, both through the horizontal cells and the amacrine cells at either of these boundaries. So we said there's the three layers, the, the uh, neurophotoreceptors, the bipolar cells, and the ganglion cells. And then there are these uh, other cells that are interacting at the interfaces. Remember I showed you that super crazy diagram of the ribbon synapse um, that's right here? Well, part of that is some of those horizontal cells are, are turning up that synapse and others are turning it down depending upon information they're getting from adjacent cells. So imagine this. Imagine there is some sort of picture uh, that I am going to lay uh, over the, the room. Each chair has got a different color, and if I were to go up above it somehow and look down, I could see that picture, right? And if I were uh, to tell you what your color was and what color the chair you were sitting in and ask you what uh, the whole picture was, you may have a hard time imagining that. So, for example, Ming, if I were to tell you your, uh, your color was red, uh, can you guess what the whole picture is? Not at all. Not at all. But um, what if you could ask the people right around you what their color was? So uh, why, don't, why don't you ask uh, your, your neighbors there? She's red. Very good. And, and, and ask Patricia here. Red. She's also red. Yeah. So ask uh, the three in the front. White, white, they're all white. Yeah. And what about behind? Also white. Yeah. And so uh, ask the gentleman in the corner over here. I'm blue. Blue. Uh huh. And there's, I'll sit over here. kind of star-shaped white. <laughs> right. okay. So now you may have be able to guess that it's like the American flag, right, that I was projecting down there for patriotism. Um, and uh, so that's what this horizontal integration is doing, right? It's, it's helping to form the broader picture uh, of, of the image that's being projected on the retina by having cells right next to each other uh, having their activity modulated by what's happening beside them, all right? So there, there's information processing that's happening right in the wall of the retina. Okay. I don't, I'm, I'm going slow today. I want to keep moving. Um, depth perception. So... <clears throat> Yeah, depth perception basically comes uh, 
because it's like you triangulate the distance. Uh, you're, you're triangulating uh, the, the changes between one eye and the other eye. You're comparing information that's coming in from this eye and how slightly different is the brain is comparing how slightly different that is uh, in comparison to the other eye. And from that, it's, it's putting together how far away that object must be via triangulation. Um, the way this information gets integrated with one another, there's information from the eye that uh, goes from the left eye to the left brain, but some of it also goes from the left eye to the right brain, and vice versa. These are not meant to be colors that you're seeing. These are just referring to parts of the visual field there. So your, uh, your binocular vision, or your, uh, the vision that you have that has got depth to it, a sense of depth, uh, that's really just in the middle of your field of view. So if you, if you close your left eye and you, look, and you kind of look, you look ahead and, and like pay attention to your periphery and see the thing that you can see the closest on the left, that is the, that is the margin, the farthest margin of binocular vision if you were to open your eye. And all that other stuff that just came into your field of view as you open the second eye, that is you have no sense of depth there. So... Um, that's what the optic chiasm is for. This is what the optic chiasm is for. So uh, you can have, I, I used to have a slide in here where I looked at lesions in the optic chiasm. It's pretty interesting the kind of things that happen to your vision. But you can have you can cut the optic chiasm here and still have your full field of view. You see everything, but you'd have no depth perception. Uh, there's there's different types of lesions that you can have that lead to strange things uh, in, in the site, but we'll just we'll keep trucking past that because I want to talk about the ear. I only got a half hour. Is that right? Yeah, 40 minutes. Um, all right, we did the anatomy. I don't think there's any other point to that slide. It's just reviewing the anatomy. Uh, yeah, all of this is just a review of the anatomy that we already covered in lab. Um, I guess this is an interesting diagram because it, it, may, it depicts the point that I made where the fluid at the oval window goes up, uh, go, goes up through um, the scale of vestibuli and uh, then connects with, so the vestibular duct is also what we call that, and then connects with uh, the tympanic duct and comes all the way back down and ends up at the round window, which I can't reach that high to, to point to that, but it's up there. Uh, it's all one. It's all one chamber. So, I want to get to how this actually works. Um, maybe I'll go over a little bit of the anatomy again here on this slide, though. So, uh, again. Scala, uh, tympani, or tympanic duct, those are synonyms. Uh, vestibular duct, cochlear duct, basilar membrane, vestibular membrane, pectoral membrane, uh, organ of cordy with the outer and inner hair cells. All right, those are the parts. Here is the spiral ganglion. Just anatomy, anatomy everywhere. Okay. So here's a picture of what the, the cochlear hairs, uh, hair cells actually look like. Uh, pretty amazing little structures in there that give us our sense of hearing. There are three rows of outer hair cells and one row of inner hair cells. Um, now I'm going to talk about how sound is going to stimulate these hair cells, how this actually works to give us uh, our sense of hearing. But first, this is like a, a little bit of very basic, like, high school level physics, okay? Um, when you hear a sound, what you're actually hearing, um, you know, like, I'm sure most of you have probably seen Star Wars or whatever, right? You know, well, maybe you've seen a trailer of Star Wars or something like that, but like spaceships 
zooming around in outer space, right? And what are the what is it like? It's like like all that stuff, right? Lasers, explosions, and all that. That is not how it works out there uh, because there, no one can hear you scream in outer space. That's kind of, it's, it feels like that's the name of a book or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> when something is vibrating, creating sound, it's creating pressure waves in the air, right? There's pressure waves in, in, the, in the gaseous medium. Uh, that we live in. And it is those pressure waves that are going to vibrate the tympanic membrane. And uh, so let's look at just a wave and, and let's uh, remind ourselves of some of the parts of a the wave. There is the wavelength, the wavelength, uh, which you can measure in centimeters, for example, or you can take the reciprocal of that and uh, and talk about frequency, right? So how many hertz, how many beats, how many peaks per minute uh, are you? So that's what a hertz is, it's peaks per minute. So this is frequency. And uh, so how the, when this gets closer, when the wavelength gets uh, shorter, the frequency goes up, higher frequency, that's a higher, what we call a higher pitch. So uh, that frequency, you know, longer wavelengths would be like, whoop, sort of like that, right? Everybody got that. Cool. So in this direction, however, this is amplitude. And this is a direct measure of the actual energy of, at that frequency. It's the actual energy at that frequency. Um, so this is what we experience as volume. This is what we experience as volume. Like, how strong are these waves that are coming in? Are they like weak waves or are they strong waves? So energy is being encoded in this in really two ways, right? The higher frequency, it takes higher energy, more energy to get something high frequency. And then it can be greater intensity or higher amplitude at whatever frequency you're at. Does that make sense? So uh, these waves come in, impinge upon the tympanic membrane, and cause it to vibrate. This vibration is transduced through the beautiful motion of the uh, auditory ossicles to uh, the stapes, which is the foot of which sits right into that oval window. Uh, that oval window vibrates and creates uh, vibration, vibrational patterns in the uh, perilymph of the vestibular duct, which is going to be uh, transmitted to the basilar membrane of uh, the cochlear duct, and it's going to stimulate the, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see how that works in a second. Uh, and then the pressure wave comes back down and is relieved at the round window. So this vibration that happens at the basilar membrane is essentially going to take those hair cells and rub them against the tectorial membrane, thus stimulating them. All right? So uh, this is how we get the frequency uh, action of it. So very schematic uh, representation. Here's the stapes. When the stapes pushes in, the fluid gets pushed this way, and it def and because of that wavelength, there's like an energy wave. Uh, the like frequency of that wave is going to uh, have a harmonic resonation at one point in uh, that basilar membrane of the cochlear duct, and it's going to push that, deform that uh, out of out of plane and towards the round window. So this round window goes out. And then the stapes moves, stapes moves the other direction, and this membrane moves up, this membrane moves in. So it's this kind of like action like this. You guys following it? Yeah, it's not, it's not too hard. So the thing is, this basilar membrane, there's this labeled line code that is associated with the length of the, the basilar membrane uh, that we have mapped into the auditory cortex. 
where high frequency sounds, which have short wavelengths, they're going to they're going to uh, stimulate they're going to stimulate uh, the membrane close here, very short distance away, and we're going to, our brain will interpret that as a high pitch sound, and then low pitch sounds are going to be way over here. All right. So 16 hertz down to 1,000 hertz. The like, the rocker notch is right around here. Anyone who likes loud music or whatever, uh, when you have like damaged hair cells, it's usually the four kilohertz notch in your hearing. It's right about there. Okay, so let's let's look at oops. Let's look and see uh, how this actually works. Those hair cells that are embedded in the, uh, in the organ of Cordy, they, all these hairs are sticking up uh, out of the top of the, of the sensory receptor. They have these potassium channels that are closed and have this little linking protein, this tip link, uh, tip linked protein that when these hair cells are tipped to the side, that tip protein kind of rips the door off that protein and allows potassium to flood into the cell. It's as simple as that. Pretty incredibly, actually, delicate system. Incredibly delicate system. Okay. And because the cochlea is a spiral, it's, it's actually, it's about the biophysics of the structure, the mechanical structure of the cochlea that enables it to be responsive to the range of frequencies that it has. Uh, this nerve, as I had said earlier, maps, uh, we have, I have it as a, a color heat map here, or a rainbow, but it, these are meant to represent different frequencies. It maps these different frequencies into the auditory cortex of uh, the brain. So <clears throat> remember that um, remember that for any sensory stimulus to reach our consciousness, what did I say had to happen? There had to be a synapse in one specific place. In the thalamus. That's right. And we have that. It's in the, the medial geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. It does happen here. We also, so we have the sensory information come in, goes to these cochlear nuclei, the brain stem, that is going to be a clearinghouse for this stuff. But if it's going to go up to the brain at all, for us to know that we heard something, uh, it's going to, it's going to, Synapse in the inferior colliculi, because remember, remember I talked about the corpora quadrigemina yesterday, and superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus. I, I didn't talk about, I, I should have, I, I skipped it on that slide, I forgot to mention, uh, on the, audit, the visual pathway, I, I think it, it showed uh, the synapse through the thalamus in that as well. But, uh, so what, what would this thing here be, just testing you? What is that little bump meant to be? The, what's that? The, yes. The, well, it's certainly something gland. The pineal gland. The pituitary is on the other side. Remember, it has the, the mammillary glands, uh, the mammillary bodies. Uh, it's got the little scarf of the, of the optic chiasm behind it. This is, it's like directly on the other side of what we're looking at. This is uh, the, it's, it's in the back. The dark is in the back. The pituitary uh, is in the front. This is the pineal gland. Okay, so that's the auditory projection pathway. Is there any other point I want to make with that? I don't know. I think not. So hearing is freaking incredible, man. I like it seems simpler than visual vision, and in some ways the like the the mechanics of it and the neuro uh, the neuromolecular underpinning of it is more simplistic than vision, but uh, just look at this. So the, the dynamic range of sensation that the ears can be responsive to, 
It's over a trillion fold power range. The de this, so this is the decibel scale at uh, zero decibels, right? It's the lowest audible sound. Uh, 30 decibels, so this is a logarithmic scale, right? 10 decibels, 10 decibels is a 10 power, uh, a 10 fold power ratio. 20 decibels is, is uh, 100. 30 is 1,000, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the amplitude ratios that you get from that. At 30 decibels, you're in a quiet library. So like this is about 30 decibels here. Um, quiet office or a living room, bedroom, away from traffic is about 40. Light traffic at a distance. Uh, air conditioner at 20 feet. Um, is, is probably like sitting through a lecture with me, um, sort of like an air conditioner, I guess, uh, <laughs> and busy traffic. So if you spend um, continuous time in busy traffic or a noisy restaurant, you will have some potential hearing damage, some hearing loss. Uh, say you are a subway operator and don't use uh, some sort of hearing protection. Uh, if you do that for more than eight hours, you can expect some sort of a hearing impairment from that. Uh, truck traffic, I mean, it goes up and up. But chainsaw, if you use, if you use a chainsaw for more than two hours, uh, that's 100 decibels. That is a, a 10 billion, a 10 billion fold power uh, ratio increase. That's incredible. Uh, and you will you'll definitely have some uh, stuff. This is my favorite line here. Heavy metal rock concert. Immediate danger. <laughs> Went to see immediate danger this weekend. What? Um, yeah, sandblasting, thunderclap. Uh, if you get struck by lightning, geez, uh, you're in immediate danger. Uh, yeah, obviously, obviously, uh, gunshots are immediate danger. Um, Jet plane, etc. Rocket launching pad. <laughs> Hearing loss inevitable. <laughs> if you find yourself on a rocket launching pad when, when it's about to go off, hearing loss is the least of your worries. This is incredible, though. There is no other sensation on your body that can give you a trillion fold power ratio, right? Think of light touch, right? It's like the lightest touch that you can actually sense that you felt. And then take the power of that and multiply it by a trillion. You would be squashed, right? You would be a smear. Light, right? Like the lowest, if you took, you know, I said that you can sensate, you know, a single photon. But if you took a trillion photons and focused them on the same point, you'd be blowing a hole through the back of your head, right? There is no sense that has even close to the range of sensation that hearing does. It's remarkable. It's remarkable. Yes, sir. What happened if you like, tasted or smelled too much? If you would tasted or smelled too much, what does that mean? Tasted or smelled too much. Tasted or smelled too much. <laughs> yeah, you're you're like you're talking about my son's bedroom now. Um, tasted or <laughs> smelled too much. Uh, well, the thing about uh, the thing about those senses is they're saturatable because that's a chemical. Those are chemically gated, right? Uh, so you can't really sense too much. You're just going to, you just get saturated and then you can't, there's like an upper limit to it depending upon the density of, of photoreceptors that are there. Um, okay, so this is to say that here is this, this wise young woman, uh, you know, taking some time off from studying anatomy and physiology to, to listen to the sound of crickets or whatever. And look at how uh, happy her hair cells are there. She's, she's having a, a lovely time. I'm, I'm sure this guy is having fun, but, uh, you know, it's how, it's, how to, it's how to hurt yourself. It's how to hurt yourself. I know, I definitely did too much of that when I was young. I suffer the consequences now. Um, one of the things, that, the last point I'll, I'll make about hearing, because I think I'm about to go on from hearing, is that 
if you experience some hearing loss, if you think you've experienced some hearing loss, and I don't know, has anyone ever gone to a concert and had their ears ring afterwards? Yeah, like, like uh, and, and usually your hearing comes back and the, and the ringing goes away. If it, it doesn't go away or if you're like, you find that you have a harder time in conversational listening to like hearing a person inside of a noisy room than you used to or something, it's a good time to get your hearing checked because <clears throat> the thing about hearing loss, the longer you address hearing loss, the harder it is to recover because what happens is the brain is, is like a use it or lose it. It's a muscle, right? And if though that part of the cortex over here, this part of the cortex that is responsible for mapping sound and then like auditory discrimination and like the complex auditory processing that has to happen, if they go unused, if they go unused because this is what your uh, ear looks like, they're, they're not getting signal from this. Those neurons uh, get withered, right? They, they get trimmed away. And so you lose part of that cortex. So just uh, fixing this problem is not the only problem with hearing loss. It's, it's like people who have had chronic hearing loss and didn't get it addressed, and then they have a harder time hearing anyways, even if you just amplify the sound. All right, so that's, that's another thing to think about. Um, you know, people think that hearing loss is something that only happens to really old people or whatever. Actually, 30% uh, of people over the age of 50, which I, I know sounds old to you, but it's not that old. 30% um, uh, of, of people over 50 have uh, some kind of hearing deficit that should be addressed. Um, there, I forget the exact statistic, but there's a, a large percentage of the population that has hearing loss that should be corrected. Uh, but it is not, and often because of the stigma of having something in your ear or whatever. But, uh, it, it should not be a stigma. Okay. The internal ear. And, and this is when I was going to, like, introduce Grady. He was going to come in and talk about his cochlear implants and everything, but he's not here today. So I'm going to talk about the vestibular cochlear system. Uh, maybe I'll get Grady in here. Maybe I won't. We'll see. Um... So the vestibular cochlear system is, it's right next to, uh, I'm sorry, the, co the vestibular system is right next to the cochlea, but it has a totally, and it has a lot of similar pieces, but it's, it's like, it has a different function. It's responsible for telling us about our motion and balance and uh, our sense of gravity and acceleration. Um, okay. And, oh yeah, and then like, sense of rotation that happens in three dimensions. So let's start with that. Uh, let's look at the hair cells. These hair cells are much like the hair cells uh, in the spiral organ. Uh, here's a, a beautiful colorized picture of them. Um, they're going to give us information about the direction and strength of some kind of mechanical stimulus. And they're, they're uh, located in these two things. So we really two separate, two separate uh, functionalities here. There's these semicircular canals, which are going to talk about rotation in three dimensions, and then this is going to be our sense of gravity or acceleration. All right. Uh, and each of these structures here, the crista ampullaris, and then the macula in the saccule and the utricle, uh, all have these hair cells embedded in them. Here, we'll, we're going to talk about the crista ampullaris and rotation in three dimensions first. So here's the crista, here's the copula, the gel, here are the hair cells that are embedded in it, and if you rotate in, three, in some direction, that fluid that is in that semicircular canal just flows one way or the other, bends the copula, and stimulates the hair cells. Uh, and gives us a sense of moving in that particular direction or not. Um, so you can perhaps appreciate why these uh, three semicircular canals are at right angles to uh, each other in the, in the three spatial directions. Uh, because of the, the, their orthogonal disposition or right degree disposition with one another, uh, they're able to sample three-dimensional space fully. All right, so uh, here is uh, a picture 
of how they know whether you're, this is how it knows whether you're rotating forward versus backward. There is a directionality to these hair cells and whether they get bent uh, towards or away from this uh, reference hair called the kinocilium. Um, if it gets uh, bent towards the kinocilium, there's a depolarization, and if it gets uh, uh, bent away from the kinocilium, it inhibits the sensory neuron. The kinocilium is kind of this stiff uh, hair cell that, that serves as a reference point for the other hair cells. All right, on to the saccule and the utricle and our sense of acceleration and gravity. So um, the structure of this has this, uh, this gel, much like the cupula in the ampule, has this gel area in the macule, this gelatinous material, with this staticonia, these little crystals of uh, calcium carbonate. And here are some pictures of them, these gorgeous little crystals embedded in the top of this gel. Uh, all of it makes an otolith. Oto meaning ear, lith meaning stone, an ear stone. So my uh, wife, does anybody know Denise Bruzewitz in the Environmental Studies Department? She just got, uh, she just got tenure and it's been a long process getting us there. I've gone through a lot making sure that our, our whole family makes it through to that point. And one of the things that I, uh, and you know, happy to do it, uh, one of the things that I had to uh, experience is probably the word I'll, I'll use, uh, was I went to uh, visit her family on numerous occasions, and she has her great-grandmother, Grandma Jan, uh, who this woman uh, won the McChesney Park, uh, she was July, of 2006 in the McChesney Park uh, cooking calendar. And she won by submitting her, um, what she called 7-Up Salad was, was her recipe. And in this calendar, she, she claims that it was the family's favorite recipe that it pull out on special occasions and blah, 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 like total bullshit. Um, <laughs> and, but, like everyone in the family thinks this stuff is repulsive. But I tried it. She pulled it out for me, won it. She made it for me. And like, here, have some of this stuff. Uh, it is, and, and I, there's a point to this. I'll get to it. Um, it is lime jello that is made with, let's see if I can remember it right. It's, it's lime jello made with 7-Up. She uses 7-Up instead of water to make it. Um, and then on top of it, she layers... Um, Bananas, and then uh, sour cream or cream cheese or some kind of like creamy crap, and then and then she'll put shredded cheddar cheese on top of that because she's from Wisconsin, you know, and, and she like come out with like bless her soul, like love her. She come out with this Jello thing, right, and. And it's just like big green mass with all this, you know, cheese and like, I don't know, stuff on top of it. And the jello is going like this, right? Because it's got all this weight on top. And, um, and I, I <laughs> just looking at what was coming for me. Uh, and like, cheese, like parts of cheese are, are falling off left and right. I think of that actually when I, when I, when I think of, of this, right? The like gravity of the situation. Because it, it was this like gelatinous material with these <coughs> these stones, basically of calcium carbonate on top that give it mass, right? It's giving it like inertial mass to increase the vibrational uh, the vibrational capacity of of the gelatinous uh, the gelatinous uh, macula. So what happens here is when a person uh, tilts themselves back, for example, just in this diagram, this jello starts sliding with all the mass of bananas and cheddar cheese on top, 
uh, and, and sets off uh, the hair cells that are underneath uh, that macula, okay? So anything, it doesn't, it, this, this can give you like gravity, so acceleration due to gravity will do it, or like motion, like accelerating a car or something. Um, that is gonna, is, gonna trigger, uh, is gonna trigger this. This is where, so you maybe have heard of people who have been in some kind of injury, and, like a car accident or something, and then they like, they lose all of their sense of balance, uh, right? And it's because some of these otoliths get dislodged. They get uh, broken off of the uh, macula and it like completely throws their entire, it's actually a pretty horrible condition. It's, and it's difficult to remediate uh, for these people. But, um, all right. So here are the projection pathways uh, for that. Um, and the point that I want to make with this is simply that um, this is a sensory neuron. Here's the first order uh, neuron, the actual sensory receptor, the first order neuron from the vestibular nerve. It's, it's going to synapse in some vestibular nuclei in the brainstem and ascend to where? The thalamus, the second order neuron is going to synapse in the thalamus. If we're going to know what's happening, it's got a synapse in the thalamus for it then to rise uh, to the vestibular cortex in the parietal lobe. Um, okay? So the, the, the point being all of these uh, senses, whether they're general or special senses, are going to have for the, us to be aware of them happening if they're going to rise to higher cortical levels that... that uh, you know, relate to our sense of consciousness, going to have to have a synapse in the thalamus. There are other synapses that are, uh, that are happening, radiating off of that synapse as well. They're not being depicted here. So we know that the thalamus is, is part of the basal nuclei, right? Which go, you have the insula on the outside with the putamen, the internal capsule, and then there's the, the caudate and the thalamus, right? So all of, all of that is one complex uh, and I said the insula was responsible for our sense of consciousness and awareness uh, to begin with, right? So we have, we, have, uh, we have to have synapsing in the thalamus. Okay, that's a recap. You guys are getting out 10 minutes early today. Uh, I talked about ocular anatomy, did some talk about optics, then gave you the, the, the basic molecular mechanism of photoreception and... Uh, diverged a little bit to talk about retinal information processing, visual pathways, color vision. Uh, moved on to the ear, oral anatomy, cochlear function, uh, the projection pathways, and then the vestibulo, uh, vestibular system, balance, orientation, and motion. Any questions? <laughs>